Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on advanced design and programming. So we are in the last but one uh, session and today's topic, pulling together many of the previous threads, will be collaboration-based design. We will be drawing on uh, design by contract, on uh, design patterns and various other concepts. We will see that collaboration-based design is a design approach uh, based on roles and that this is present in many different contexts on a programming language level, on a modeling level and so forth and ties in nicely with design patterns. So um, collaboration-based design is a modeling approach, meaning Going back to the initial discussion on are we modeling the world or are we just programming something efficiently, collaboration-based design is clearly on the side of we want to capture the dynamics of the real world using a description or modeling language that is as close to that real world as is possible. So not moving registers and a processor register values around, but really using terminology from the real world that lets us capture the domain of the Fachlichkeit in German appropriately. And collaboration-based design is one such approach which focuses on the recognition that objects do not stand alone, but rather always play or collaborate, interact with other objects and that these collaborations keep recurring. Hence, you can model them, model them. You're abstracting from the single instances, from the individual instances. And that this sets the focus on the collaboration of these objects where the whole behavior of an object then becomes an overlapping, an overlap of all the different collaborations that the object is involved in. And just to say, an object can play roles or participate in multiple collaborations for different purposes at once. And so I already used the term role. Collaborations or collaboration descriptions have previously, before UML came along, uh, called this role modeling because designing the collaboration between objects was describing the roles that objects in such a collaboration played and that was previously called role model. So I will go back and forth between that older terminology role models and the newer terminology collaboration uh, specification or instance. Within such a description of collaboration, for example, a parent-child object relationship in a tree structure, uh, we will talk about the roles. So the superior object will play the parent role and the subordinate object will play the child role. These are the roles. And together with the interaction between parent role and child role, we are describing the actual collaboration. So the collaboration specification or the role model is the combination of the description of the roles each participant in the collaboration plays and then how they actually play or interact with each other. So a collaboration specification, also known as a role model, consists of role descriptions or role types. And uh, these are the descriptions of the runtime behavior, where the runtime behavior then becomes the enactment of these collaboration specifications, which we then call a collaboration instance, if parent and child objects interact at runtime in a particular way. Um, and uh, so that is the instance level. As so often, we have a clear distinction between modeling something and then executing it at runtime, which becomes the instance. The object is the runtime phenomenon, well, the object, which plays these roles according to the role types. And the class of the object is the home of the different role types that its instances can fulfill in different collaborations, but more on that uh, later. 
what we get from this is a better separation of concerns. I'm pretty sure that when you think about the classes you have programmed in the past and say the methods it offers to clients that you have thought about oh, this set of method is for maintaining the tree structure and that set of methods is for notifying dependent objects about state changes and that third set of methods is about providing the main functionality whatever the tree structure was about. So role modeling or collaboration based design, design using collaborations, uh, has a natural built in high level of separation of concerns because a well done collaboration really focuses on one purpose and one purpose only. While a full blown class model, as we will see, has to integrate all these different purposes, overlapping, overlaying and so forth. From a clear and clean separation of concerns also follows that whatever we model, the collaborations, is likely to be more easily reusable than the class models. Because, well, it's smaller and it's, if well done, very well focused. So by its smaller size, it's already more nicely composable and then we have a rationale, a design rationale now, the focus on a particular purpose of collaboration, which makes it likely that if that purpose occurs elsewhere, that then the collaboration or the role model can be used again because it's exactly about that one purpose and nothing else. So nothing else gets in the way of reusing the collaboration. When we look at systems then, uh, we we'll quickly discover that there are different types of collaborations or categories perhaps. The most obvious and the most important one perhaps is why an object exists in the first place, which I call the primary service collaboration. Um, an object like a graphical object in a graphical editor has a primary purpose, like it can be drawn on a canvas. Um, and that is the primary purpose and to be able to draw the object on the canvas it offers some methods and so we have a natural client service interaction which is a simple straightforward collaboration with uh, two role types the client and the service and the service part contains all those methods of an object that can be drawn onto a canvas. The client in this collaboration often simply uses these methods of the service but has no methods themselves. They often are methodless, but logically they exist because, well, you need a client if you offer a service, uh, because without a service, why would you offer, without a client, why would you offer a service? So you need to uh, clearly need both, even if the client, because of a lack of methods, appears to be invisible. Not having methods does not mean there is not associated behavior. Uh, there are often rules that a service puts onto its clients to follow before it can be used correctly. Uh, this brings us back to design by contract. If we have a simple primary service collaboration with a client and a service, we can structure this nicely using design by contract. Um, we will limit then design by contract to only the role types and the collaboration or not full-blown class interfaces but that makes a lot of sense. There are also what I call here secondary service collaborations. So collaborations within a set of objects that uh, have a technical purpose, like um, if you have a graphical object, um, then maybe it can compose other objects. So you have a tree structure naturally, you can group objects and the client wants to um, and a client uh, next to using the primary service collaboration, drawing the objects, uh, may also want to do other stuff like rearranging the hierarchy. So that's a second collaboration, rearranging the hierarchy. And uh, that's what I call a secondary service collaboration. It's not why the objects exist, so it's not primary but it's still something that clients do with it, how the objects have to open themselves up to, uh, to its clients. 
And then there are what I call maintenance collaborations here, a third type of collaboration which serves to maintain the inner logic of the domain model among the objects that are instances of the classes from the domain model. So for example, within, um, within the graphical object, a group of graphical objects, as you resize it, you may have state change notifications flying around so that changing one object has, has effects on other objects and that's properly recognized. So there's no external client. Uh, the clients, if you will, are internal to the object, but they exist to maintain the logic of the uh, group of objects. Let's put it uh, to the test or to an example. Uh, previously, we talked about the file system, uh, which we modeled like this. Each element in the file system is a node. So it has a name, has a size, maybe access rights. This is not a complete depiction of the model. And then there are different types of nodes modeled here as subclasses. Uh, there is the regular file, so that contains data, and maybe it has additional methods for reading and writing data. There's the link, which points to another node, which could be another link or some file or a directory. And so the link would have methods for retrieving or setting the target uh, object, the targeted object. And of course, we have a directory, which is a third type of node here, where the main thing about the directory is that it can contain further nodes. And by that recursive relationship, uh, we can build the directory tree or the folder structure that constitutes we have in most file systems. And as you may remember, that's an application or a use of the composite design pattern here between directory being the composite, compo composite participant and node being the component participant. And that's a straightforward design based on classes. What I'll do now is to break it down into smaller pieces for demonstration purposes. You don't necessarily have to overdo it with role modeling or collaboration based design, but to understand it here, let me be uh, fairly detailed. In this design that we just saw in the class model, we have these four primary service collaborations. And so there is a node, a link, a file, and a directory service collaboration, primary service collaboration. So each class naturally has a primary service collaboration where it has functions, methods that are new to what they inherited, and that's why that class exists in the first place. The node as an abstraction can tell a client, again, about its name and its size. A link can provide the targeted object or targeted node. A file has read and write methods and the directory lets you iterate over its children. Um, when you look at this, you may not know, may not recognize the diagrammatic notation being used here. It's from UML and we will come back to that. This is how in UML you can describe collaborations meaning these are collaboration specifications, the models of collaborations, which then need to be instantiated. Um, you can see a rectangular box that would be a role type and then the dashed uh, oval around it that shows the boundary of the collaboration. So the node uh, collaboration contains two roles, client and node. And so do the other collaborations, always just a client and then a role for the primary service. Very simple, but it will get a bit more complicated in a bit. On a code level, you can simply express this as methods in the class interfaces. Though maybe, or that's what I'm doing here, you want to signal to readers that the following set of methods is basically what a role suggests you put here. So the whole node interface could get large, but you can split it into parts where each part or each section of the interface 
corresponds, corresponds with one role type, is a code level representation of one role type uh, from one of the role models or collaborations that the node class makes possible for its instances. And so the methods you see here are those that I suggested, um, having a name for the node, having a target for the link, reading and writing data for the files. Here's a slightly more complex uh, role model or collaboration. It's used for maintaining the hierarchical structure of the folder, of the folders. Um, bear with me why I use perhaps these funny names, but you can see there are three roles now, one called client, one called owner, and one called owned. The owner role is that object in the tree which contains the other objects. So it's straightforward and there's actually no recursion yet. So the owner has a set of owned objects, the subordinate objects, so the objects in a directory later on, and that's it. There is a separate third client role because we need the client because it's the client who knows how to configure this relationship. Ultimately, it's a user uh, using some UI or command line to manipulate the folder structure. So they move files around and the directory does not do it by, by itself. So we need a client that configures owner and owned relationships. And hence, we need these three uh, role types. Um, on a code level, we are going back to classes and we take the role types and make it a section of the class interfaces. And as you can see, I annotated here with the particular collaboration name and then put down the methods from those role types. So you can see um, the um, owner, the owned element of the owned uh, role type is assigned to the node class because any node can be owned. You can see the composite pattern coming, obviously. And then the directory object is the owner uh, object or place the owner role and correspondingly has the methods from the owner role type, like um, being able to receive or having removed some owned objects, being able to iterate over it. And the third role client is methodless. I'm a bit pedantic here, but separately from having the top-down tree structure, I also have a bottom-up child-to-parent relationship that I want to model. You may argue, doesn't that belong to the owner-owned relationship? Ultimately, it will because it goes together, but I'm splitting it or separating it out here for demonstration purposes. A child has one parent in this example, and it doesn't say anything about the parent, uh, um, uh, any object that plays the parent role by some other means may have other objects that are also child objects in relation to it. But here it's only about the interaction between one child and one parent, hence the one-to-one -one relationship. And the thing here is it simply needs to be maintained. So the methods here are that a parent, a child has a parent, then the parent needs to know the child and the child needs to know the parent. So they basically get and set methods uh, that we assign to, to the node. And we do that in this case, um, both uh, to the node. We will see the composite pattern later on, again, how it combines these different role models, collaboration specifications. I already worked and talked about classes, even though my focus was on collaborations. That's because you really need both. You, at least in the programming languages that we use, where we have classes as the main implementation uh, unit or file system unit or code compilation unit. <laughs> um, so, we absolutely need to work with classes, but we now also want to model collaboration specifications, so we need to map them to classes. These coexist, and we need both. And 
to understand that, again, the collaboration focuses on the interaction between multiple objects. So it's involved not just usually with one class, but with multiple, though of course the roles from the collaboration in some cases could be all provided by the same class, from the class to the class itself, that's where possible. And then the class is the unit of integration, of integration of these different role types from different role models so that its instances can collaborate with other objects through these role models, through these collaborations. And they can cross over from one purpose of collaboration into another collaboration with another purpose. So if you change um, the uh, if you change an object through the primary service collaboration and other objects depend on that, then you make that service call that changes the object. But using the observer pattern, the changed object may have to notify other objects which registered the interest in any state change on that object. And it does so. The moment it notifies these other objects, it just changed the control flow went from the primary service collaboration to the observer instance as observer pattern application collaboration uh, does its job there and then flows back into the original object maybe that send out the state change notification and goes back to the primary service collaboration so control flow enters an object through some collaboration or as part of some collaboration in the implementation of the class for that object then the control flow might cross over into another collaboration where that other collaboration then does some things until the control flow returns to the previous collaboration. The class is, becomes the integration point of these collaborations, by the way, uh, how the class picks up the role types and the code you program goes from one collaboration to the next. So both is important the classes and the role types. A class picks up, we will see in a few slides, it's called binds in UML, binds multiple role types. And as the class implements them, it crosses over between these different role types and the corresponding collaborations. So here we can see that. Um, this is the file system example again. Uh, the focus is on the node class. The node class, um, is involved in, at least in this diagram, there's more of course, but here it's only three collaboration specifications, the three I introduced. The primary service collaboration called node client and the primary and the hierarchy collaboration for the owner and owned relationship and the parent-child collaboration for the well parent-child maintenance relationship. So Using UML, this is uh, UML, the dashed ellipses are the collaborations, the rectangular objects are the classes, and you can see the notation of role binding, where the roles defined in a particular collaboration specification are bound to the particular class, which means the class has to implement that role type. So hierarchy specifies owner and owned role types and now the directory class and now the owner role type is bound to the directory class which means the directory class has to implement the corresponding methods and same and a similar thing happens with node where the owned role type from hierarchy is bound to the node class and now the node class has to implement the corresponding methods. The parent, op, the parent role type is bound to, from the parent-child collaboration is bound to directory and the child role type from the parent-child collaboration is bound to the node and the client is bound to the example command I'm using here, listing a directory and the node from the primary service collaboration is uh, bound to the node class. So this is how you might want to zoom in on a class diagram, whether you explicitly modeled it or not, 
by looking at how between these classes or how these classes define different or pick up different role types that regulate or structure the collaboration of the instances with each other at runtime. The idea of these collaborations is of course that you, well one idea is that you might be able to multiple times use it. Can we have the composite pattern captured as a row a collaboration specification and then used over and over again even with partial or complete implementations. Uh, this eludes us. Right? We don't have that in current programming languages. There is no good library of design patterns implemented and ready to use because the gap between the idea and the illustration in the design patterns book and the actual code is too far, too wide. There's too much variation you need. Collaboration specifications might be different. I will discuss later whether why that is just a might. But um, a collaboration uh, is much more focused, doesn't combine these different things that you might find even in a design pattern, this uh, illustration. So in order to be used in multiple contexts, it first of all needs to be independent of those. So it can't have application specific names. That's why it's not node and directory, but owner and owned and parent and child. But then it also needs to be possible that as you bind a generic model or a more general model to a particular context that you want to, that you can rename the methods to reflect the terminology of that particular problem. That's actually where it fails. Most programming languages don't have such a binding and renaming function. However, as a programmer, you always want to choose specific names that talk about the class and the domain as well, the domain suggests you talk about your objects and so forth. So um, for this to work well, programming languages would have to support uh, collaboration-based design, which they barely do. And Java barely does it, we'll look at it, but not too well. Collaboration-based design works really nicely again with uh, again works with design by contract because the relationship between uh, the role types and the collaboration specification that's exactly what you want to describe by design by contract and design by contract already made us aware of there's not just a lonely interface no there's always a client and so collaboration specifications also clearly state that there cannot be a lone role type. There's at least a second role type somewhere uh, because uh, you cannot just interact without having an interaction partner. Let me tease this apart uh, to avoid any confusion or to avoid confusion. Um, we have a class model and a bit more abstract we have design templates and even more abstract we have design patterns and these are categories so they are not easy to cross uh, a design pattern uh, as in the design patterns book and as discussed is always an illustration you look at the structure diagram in the design patterns book that is not a class model there is no defined formal language for these uh, structure diagrams in the design patterns book the illustrations, there's no, no clear language. People have tried to come up with formal languages, but they were never good enough. Um, they never were able to capture what experienced developers wanted to express about design patterns. And hence, we decided that design patterns have remained, should remain um, an idea, and that it needs human intelligence to interpret them. Now, design templates are formalized, meaning you coded them, uh, descriptions of designs. For example, you can describe them using UML collaboration specifications. And uh, UML therefore gives you a way of describing those. And in collaboration-based design, then this becomes a collaboration or collaboration specification. And now we can establish a relationship between this reusable design template 
and a specific class model because with the modeling here UML comes also the instantiation or application by way of binding the roles of the collaboration specification to classes so that at runtime there is or can be uh, a collaboration and because there's a collaboration specification with role types that runtime collaboration can be said to be a valid execution of the program or not. And um, you can see how the design template may define roles like client owner owned and the hierarchy collaboration and parent child and the parent child collaboration and how you assign that to classes, uh, mostly the directory and node classes in a specific class model. So the class model is what you program or simply a model described using class based modeling. And the design fragment or the design template, uh, if you base it on collaborations, is very well defined as nice separation of concerns and UML um, gives you a modeling language for that. And we'll see to some extent you can also do it in programming languages. So uh, let's return for a short while to some examples. Uh, our wild site and example and the flower extension of the wild site framework. So here is to the left the flower photo or subclass of photo that we started with. Then in the center of this class model is the flower class identifying a particular flower on my balcony or in my garden and the flower type for modeling the type and uh, the flower manager for managing all the objects not just flower but also flower type objects not shown here so this is not a 100% complete class diagram. So when you look at it you see the classes and you probably want to look at the code to understand how they interact. Um, with collaboration specifications, um, you can show more in a diagram by showing how the roles bind and thereby indicating particular types of collaboration, the collaboration specifications, uh, identifying multiple purposes that an instance of flower might be involved in. I'm not using UML right now, I'm just using um, just marking it here. Um, there is a flower photo with flower collaboration. For example, that the flower photo knows which, uh, which flower uh, is being depicted and that the flower may know about its various photos. So that's one way you could have a more heavyweight collaboration specification. Then there's the flower with flower type collaboration that would be in use of the type object pattern that we discussed uh, in a previous lecture. So that's a separate purpose of collaboration, hence you make it a separate collaboration specification called flower flower type collaboration here. Then with our focus on the flower class, we have the flower manager with flower collaboration. The manager lists or maintains a collection of all these flower objects allow searching, tagging, what have you, and so forth. There even is a collaboration arguably in the hierarchy between the superclass data object and flower for saving the object into a database. Also interesting are the two gray boxes where there's an interaction between data object and object manager and that gets refined or specialized into flower and flower manager. So if a collaboration specification regulates the behavior of two or more objects playing roles in such a collaboration, then uh, you might or should be able perhaps to refine that uh, by more specialized behavior. The object manager can only in a specialized way um, uh, hand, uh, can only handle in a very general way data objects, but the flower manager might be able to add more semantics as it manages the flower objects. So maybe we want inheritance. Uh, I say maybe 
because this is even after 20 25 years still bleeding edge or not uh, something that has arrived in mainstream but it's very powerful uh, as a thinking tool which is why i'm discussing it here so as i just discussed the flower photo with flower collaboration well that's the primary service collaboration the flower flower type collaboration that's the uh, modeling of uh, what type of flower is that? That's the type object pattern. And then the flower manager with flower collaboration. That is the uh, manager pattern where you centralize the management of the flower objects in one manager object. So what we can learn from that example is that the client role often always remains implicit. We kind of leave it open and dangling because our focus was on these classes and we ignore that they are clients, but of course they exist. Um, if they actually have methods that we require of the clients, and but we can't show the clients yet because we're leaving it open, we will be talking about what frameworks do, then we might want to implement, absolutely want to implement these methods as a separate interface that can be implemented by classes. So far we only talked about how we simply put the role type, the methods from the role types into the class interface. Of course we could model each role type as its own Java interface in Java for example, which would probably be overkill. But if there is a certain role type that is often dynamically picked up, then maybe it makes sense to use a plain Java interface and uh, model it like that. That's, for example, the case with uh, the observer pattern, where the observer or the observing object, uh, the dependent object, really wants to provide that callback interface, and there will be a lot of different classes who pick it up. So you make it an interface and don't, uh, so you can, on an abstract level, implement uh, the collaboration. Uh, the example also showed how showed nicely how the uh, class model really consists of overlapping uh, overlapping um, collaboration specifications applied, and certain classes or selected classes will often be like a real core centerpiece, a hub of collaboration, and where the control flow flows in through one collaboration, flows out through another collaboration before it returns to I go on to another third collaboration and so forth before eventually returning to the initial client call. Uh, we have to think about refining collaborations. That's actually quite important. You're not just subclassing a class. You're always subclassing a class, thinking about how you also need to subclass other classes in conjunction with that class that you just subclassed. And to maintain the semantics of the domain model. And that's nothing else but refining or specializing or subclassing or subtyping. Uh, these are all synonyms, basically. Uh, the relationship between these two classes as defined by a collaboration specification. It's really important for a good designer to understand no object stands on it or no object is an island, but rather it's in the interaction and the interaction of the collaboration becomes a first-class citizen, at least in your thoughts, um, if not in your code. Uh, and also many of these collaborations, not the primary service collaborations, but many of the maintenance collaborations, these are really, really just design pattern applications because the way how some object structure maintains its inner structure, inner logic, that's so often the same, that's where the patterns are. All right, UML uh, made the leap. Uh, programming languages, not quite, but UML made the leap and introduced collaborations. I think about 16, 17, 18 years ago, 2001, 2002 or so. And so it's called collaboration. That's the specification, or sorry, what I call role model or collaboration specification to distinguish it from the use where you um, actually have that particular collaboration um, perform its behavior. Here again is the already introduced syntax of uh, 
describing uh, a collaboration, how it is in this case already bound to a particular set of classes or how the role types or the, the uh, roles in the collaboration are bound to the different uh, classes. Uh, these two diagrams separated by the bar in the middle, they are really just de depicting the same. Uh, above we can see the collaboration called observer, so it's not a pattern, it's a collaboration called observer, which has two roles, subject and observer, and they have already been bound to classes called call queue and sliding bar icon. And in the diagram on the lower on the lower bottom, that's depicting exactly the same, just using a different syntactic feature. We don't see the internals of the observer collaboration here. We only see by way of lines, annotated lines, how the subject and observer role from the observer collaboration specification are bound to the classes call queue and sliding bar icon. And um, this is actually quite powerful and you may wonder why this is not more broadly used. Well, I'm not sure what's the chicken and what's the egg here, but uh, I, you can see here a screenshot of a fairly popular UML modeling tool. If I want to create a class, uh, I right click on the canvas and select new element. And it's already annoying, but classes are one level down. So after new elements, I see the primary elements I can create like a class. So I have two clicks, right click on, then on three clicks, right click, then new element and then class and I have a new class. To find collaborations, I have to go two more menus deep here from a new element or connector through other to composite diagram and then the activate composite toolbox and that's where I can finally find the button to create a new collaboration. So again, I don't know what's the chicken, what's the egg, but if I have to browse four levels deep to create collaborations and I can't change that, then maybe I won't make much use of it in modeling and hence that may be an explanation of why it's not widely used. It's an advanced topic, or maybe not everyone's advanced. Still, um, we use advanced concepts in our mind. And so you, and I'm quite sure that you also use some idea of collaborations in your mind. Would be nice to see it in the code as well, but at the minimum you have it in your brain. This is nothing new. One well, of the very first lectures in this course about method types introduced you to vocabulary that you may already have known, different types of methods and that they have names. And you don't write down these names uh, in the code you write. You are not saying this is a getter or setter. Well, that part you could perhaps in some context, but you're not saying, oh, uh, this is a boolean query method and this is a particular assertion method you only think that but you do use it as you talk to your colleagues so people do understand it it's just not in the code it's only in the brains of people any real system has a gazillion amounts of conventions that their developers have in their mind and that they maintain it would be better if it was explicit in the code so it's not overlooked but uh, often it's not and so you have to know these conventions of how you structure code to not ruin it because if you did not observe those conventions you might end up introducing bugs and hence it is daily bread of a software developer to have things in their brain that are not explicit in code but are really quite important to know to not screw up the code. But again, it would be so much nicer if you make that gap between what's in your brain, what you know, what the other developers told you when you first joined, what you're telling new developers when they join, uh, what they need to know to not screw up the code base. So let's take a look at what can we do to make things more explicit in the code and make 
coding safer for collaborations? Well, um, this is just a proposal. If we could change Java or ex extend it, it would be very natural to do so for collaborations using the kind of pattern way of how you write code in Java. So not have just not just have class as a keyword, but have collaboration. So you would want to be able to say, I want to have a public collaboration parent child. And then within that collaboration, you would define the different role types, like the parent and the role, uh, and the parent and the child role type. And that would be like an interface, just a specific set of methods then that you specify in there. In addition to the collaboration specification keyword, you also need the binding of role types from collaboration specification to classes. So that would be like uh, implements or extends. So the class node, maybe more implements, the class node binds parent child dot child. So picks up the child node from the parent dot child relation uh, collaboration. And when you think about it, you can go so far. And that's also why this was not realized. Something like this was not really realized in Java. You can actually get there with interfaces. Except that a so broadly usable tool like interfaces, because it's so widely usable, is barely used like this because people don't get the guidance to use it like collaboration specifications would want you to do. People who don't know about collaborations look at some uh, forest of interfaces, get confused and screw it up. Here's an approach where someone made more headway. Um, they used C++ templates. So here it's adapted to Java and using generics. They used the used generics to model uh, and interfaces to model role types and collaborations. So you would put one collaboration into their own file as just one interface. So then you would need to know you have a package perhaps that is a collaboration specification and then a couple of interfaces, two or more in there for the different role types, including the methods here. And then for binding them, you would use generics. So the interfaces that represent role types would have to be parameterized with type parameters that would be the classes that you bind them to. It's a use of a very general feature of a programming language, generics or templates. And like with interfaces in general, people who have not been introduced to collaboration based design may not get what's going on. So they will quickly screw it up because they don't know the implicit rules of using this. And as a consequence, this actually quite good proposal by Van Hilst, I think, did not fly or stick in the end. I already mentioned, but would like to repeat that these client side are the, the role types that capture client behavior are often without methods. There's no methods to call on the client because it's only the client who calls the service, service methods. But using design by contract, you need to understand that the client still has to observe constraints, requirements, fulfill requirements uh, in how it uses the service role type because um, these requirements simply exist. The example again would be the file from which you cannot read or write to if you have not first opened it. So there is an ordering constraint on which methods to call in what order. And that is actually expected behavior of the client using design by client could be put into the contract specifying good client behavior. So don't forget the client, document the client and their behavior as well. Collaboration based designs and previously role modeling have been around for a while. People have always tried to find ways of expressing it or expressing similar things 
In programming languages research, there's actually a lot of such attempts, few of which made it, none of which really made it into mainstream programming languages. It's been called protocols or mixins or traits, and this is not exactly identical with role modeling, uh, but technically similar. So maybe the authors, the inventors of traits or mixins were trying to solve similar problems. But again, sadly, none of those really stuck. So we are stuck with our basic programming language and what we can express there. Finally, let's take a look at the interaction between collaboration, collaboration specifications and design patterns. It's actually a nice, enjoyable design discussion. So here's the original composite pattern from the design patterns book, even using the old notation they had back then, I think OMT. So you can see component and composite. You can see the placeholder class leaf because there are multiple leaf classes. It should be obvious to you now that this is not a class model in any sense. This is just an illustration because if it was a formal model, it would have to say one to n leaf classes, which it doesn't. Um, so you have classes here, but no role models. But of course, they are implied, uh, the role models. And um, you can now say we break down the interaction into these different parts, like owner owned and parent child and primary client and service. Or we simply say we make it one larger uh, role model or collaboration specification and work with that. Um, here again are the participants uh, explained from the composite pattern. You should know that. So um, what the different parts um, do. And here is a way of how you would express it as one particular role model. You would uh, say there is a, a node and then there are special types of node, parent and child. And there's one particular parent, so this even goes beyond the composite pattern, where that particular parent is a root, which has a separate client from the regular node client because, well, the, the root has no parent. This is a role model, so it's not been mapped to classes. You can't run it because the assumption is it will be composed together with other role models onto, uh, onto and imprinted or applied or bound to a class diagram. Or basically we will invent the classes and then map and define these classes as compositions of role types from different collaborations. Here's another way of displaying this. So the previous one this one here, that's an old work of mine. Here is how Eric Gummer expressed it once. Uh, he simply annotated the class diagram, so that's very lightweight. He simply said, okay, uh, we're looking at uh, jhotdraw, so that was a graphical uh, diagram editor, and we have a, have a class figure, which is any object on a drawing canvas, and we have a composite figure for grouping, and we have decorators and connections and so forth. We have handles attached to the figures. And there's a whole, there's a high uh, density. So first of all, the collaborations are specified by role models, but many of these role models are actually uh, design pattern instances. So you look at figure, and a figure is an object that gets observed. So it's a subject in the observer pattern. And the observer of that subject would be um, the decorator figure of when it's subject two. And we have another example of the observer two versus the observer one. Well, I don't see it right now, but there are multiple uses of the observer pattern ultimately. We have the composite pattern applied. So composite figure is obviously the composite participant in the pattern and figure is the component participant. We also have decorator figures. So these are embellishing things you draw around a figure, you adorn or embellish it with. 
So the decorator figure is the uh, decorator and the figure class is the decorated component uh, class and so forth. Uh, strategies and others. Now this is a very lightweight way of using the design patterns terminology. So it's not clean role modeling, but it's close. And also observe how they stack up. Uh, we call this a high design pattern density. When you look at some object oriented class model and some parts, which often are the center of the design, like the figure class in a graphical uh, editor, uh, classes that are at the center around those, um, uh, you find a high density, a high frequency or a large number of design patterns instantiated or applied. And that's because these objects of these classes are often involved in so many collaborations which need to maintain state and other dependencies with other objects that you need to make that very explicit by maintenance collaborations, which again are very often design pattern instances. What's not design pattern instances are the basic service uh, collaborations like draw me this, like draw a figure, that's domain specific. So uh, a very lightweight way of uh, using or working with role modeling is simply to annotate classes in how they play participants from the design patterns book, design patterns structure diagram. Here's another example. This is now a J unit. So you see the test class, middle center, and then test suite, the subclass. So that's the composite pattern. Test result is a collecting parameter, another design pattern, and so forth. So uh, even here, you see a fair number of, uh, of design patterns applied and uh, a higher design pattern density, which coincides with well understood collaborations. So with that, um, I introduce collaboration based design, a nice and effective way of breaking down complex class, mo complex class models into parts where each part is about the collaboration of objects of these classes, which collaborate for one focus. So it introduces a very nice separation of concerns. And because of that also gives us possibly reusable models nicely. Um, in practice, collaboration-based design is a great thinking tool. Our programming languages do not support it well. UML supports it, but not that much and besides most people focus on code so we would need for role modeling or collaboration based design really to be widely used we would need first class programming language support which sadly we don't have yet maybe in a future programming language with that thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in the next session